right. So I see lots of people actively joining. So uh, I just want to say thank you for attending our next Bad Elf webinar. Uh, always excited to see uh, familiar names and new names. Nice to meet you. Um, as people are joining, we're kind of just making sure that everybody gets attended here and they're going to be able to participate. I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nicholas Smolovsky. I'm the director of GIS Solutions at Bad Elf. Um, moderating with me today and co-hosting is Larry Fox, uh, VP of Marketing and Business Development. We're going to be your co-hosts today um, for this exciting webinar. And so if you have any questions about anything that we mentioned throughout this presentation today, uh, you see our emails there. It's Larry at bad-elf.com or Nick at bad-elf.com. We are here to answer your questions. Uh, we really appreciate you attending this. Also, I would love to uh, make a quick plug. If you are not doing so already, uh, please go ahead and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. So we are connected into all the different social media channels. We run advertisements. We do educational series through that. Uh, we, it's, it's just a great way to network with all of our customers from around the world. So I definitely implore you, please go ahead and uh, follow us on those social media platforms. All right, so moving right along, I just want to make sure that if you have any questions during this presentation, you are able to type them in to the uh, webinar Q&A function. Uh, you could also type it into the chat if you need to. Um, and we can get those answered at the end of the webinar. So do, again, I still see people joining the webinar, but I wanna make sure we're cognizant of everybody's time. We are recording this and we'll be posting it, so if you've missed anything, please feel free to uh, find this video on YouTube later. Uh, today, we're gonna be reviewing a few things all about the new Bad Elf Flex. Uh, we're going to start with a quick review of Flex. Um, if you haven't been following along or this is your first webinar, um, we want to make sure that everybody at least has a baseline understanding of our new product, uh, the Battle Flex. From there, we're going to start talking about some advanced features. So doing standalone data logging, excuse me, <clears throat> standalone data logging, also using the Flex uh, with the NGS Opus uh, service for post-processing for higher accuracy. We're going to talk about why the Flex uh, acts as a really good co uh, data collector for ground control points and other types of targeting uh, for, say, aerial collection or LIDAR collection. And last but not least, we're going to have another uh, Bad Elf hat contest today. So if you stick around till the end and participate, uh, we will be giving away one of our really sweet uh, fitted Bad Elf hats at the end of today's webinar. So again, I uh, really appreciate for everybody coming today. If you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A. We're going to get started right now. So 30 minutes total runtime, 25 minute presentation, and we're going to leave five minutes for a moderated Q&A at the end. So let's review the Bad Elf Flex for just a moment. We say three things about the Flex. It's accurate, it's affordable, it's versatile. So when we say accurate, it means correct in all details. It's exact, it's authoritative. And so what's nice about the Flex is it's flexible in the types of accuracies that it can provide our customers. Uh, the standard Flex right out of the gate is a 30 to 60 centimeter, one to two foot unit uh, with using SBAS. That is off the shelf, turn the unit on, Bluetooth connected to your device and you are off and running. So if you're looking for a sub-meter unit, the standard flex is the way to go. Hey, Nick, I need more accuracy. What do I do? Well, we, we offer tokens, which will allow you to get to extreme accuracy, or you can unlock the flex to get to the extreme accuracy. Uh, with the extreme accuracy mode engaged, we are um, able to lock on to the Atlas L-band satellite correction service and provide five to 10 centimeter satellite correction uh, corrected accuracy in most places of the world. Additionally, if connected to a good uh, RTK network, perhaps offered by your state or for a paid service, uh, we are seeing real-time um, observations, one-second observations at one centimeter. Additionally, you can post-process all the data collected. We're going to talk about that exclusively today. Multi-frequency, multi-constellation, it is a beast. So moving along, uh, affordable. 
So, hey, Nick, how much does this thing cost? So for under 3,000 bucks, that is gonna get you your standard off the shelf 30 to 60 centimeter flex. Uh, if you would like to unlock the flex and make it uh, be a fully survey capable rover forever, that way you, know, you can continually use it with an RTK system, um, you're looking at uh, $5,499. So uh, $5,500 and you have a fully survey grade rover. Additionally, I mentioned the tokens just a minute ago. They are $25 a day. That gives you a 24-hour countdown clock in which it will unlock the extreme version of the Flex. So if you're doing you know, not as much high accuracy collection as say GIS mapping grade collection, this would be a good option for you, um, especially if you just need to use that high accuracy a few times a year, maybe job cost it to a specific task or specific project. Lastly, uh, it's versatile, easily adaptable to a variety of activities. Um, and so you've seen the, the flex and I've got it here. You can see it's got a different form factor, a different color. If you've been following Bad Elf for the last decade, you know that we like to have fun. We, we create uh, devices that are stable, that are lightweight, that are portable, that are that, you know, simply just work, they're easy. Uh, we listen to our customers. This is all, you know, the Flex are all those things. It's IP65 rated, so, you know, um, it's going to run in water and dust and things. Obviously, we don't, you know, recommend you uh, do an underwater data collection with the Flex, but, um, you know, it, it, it's really rugged. Uh, it works with iOS, Android, and Windows, so we are agnostic in terms of the data collector or the smart device that you can connect to. We get over 12 hours of battery life with this beast, and you know, that's kind of the, the flex in the nutshell, right? So if you have any questions about the flex or pricing, please reach out to Larry or I, uh, Nick or Larry at bad-elf.com. We can certainly talk you through those things. So we wanna talk about standalone data logging today. So when we say standalone data logging, uh, what we mean when from Bad Elf, standalone logging is that you are using the flex on its own, standing alone to collect data. And so, Traditionally, our units Bluetooth connect to a smart device, and from your cell or tablet, you would fire up a collector, you know, a, a GPS collector data uh, app, such as, say, Esri um, Collector or Microsurvey, Field Genius, or uh, Avenza Maps, or AppGlose, or there's you know, dozens of these applications out there. But instead of Bluetooth connecting it <clears throat> to that device, we can leave it standing alone and it can collect data on its own. Now, I, I showed you that the Flex uh, itself actually has a screen. And so unlike a lot of the GPS on the market right now, uh, the Flex has a screen that you can actually operate, you know, like a phone or an old video game, a handheld video game system, and you can collect data from that screen. Additionally, we have a app that goes along with the Flex, so the Bad Elf Flex app that's downloadable for iOS and Android, and you see a screenshot on your screen right now of uh, one of the Flex screens. This is the logging screen. Um, so you can do redundantly this standalone logging from either the Flex itself, from that little screen I showed you, or you can do it from the app on your smart device. So again, if you don't wanna purchase or use a third-party app, standalone logging is the way to go. I do want to throw one other thing about the screen on the Flex. We got a trans-reflectant screen, which means we knew that a lot of people like us here in Arizona, when you're outside in the field collecting data, you need to have a screen that's easily readable. And so this reflectant screen, as it has more sunlight, it actually becomes easier to read. So I just wanted to throw that out there uh, if you have any questions on what kind of screen we used. So in terms of logging, standalone logging, the Flex can do a few things. So we have something called instant point logging or insta points, quote unquote, air quotes, right? Instant point logging would be I'm walking around, perhaps for a topo, I wanna click the button and I wanna collect the X, Y, and Z of that location right there, right? One second, one observation, one collected point. Uh, this is a great way if you wanna do um, random kind of collections along a path or a trail, um, a couple weeks ago, I was hiking through some really beautiful national parks and I would lay down instant points kind of as waypoints along the way as, of interest, interesting places that I could go back to later. Uh, instant points are also really nice that uh, I should also mention um, if you are connected to a third party app, say like Esri Collector, um, and you're using that primarily, you can still 
do standalone logging at the exact same time in parallel to the app on your device logging. And so you could be doing your own thing here. And if you just wanted to be real safe and I'm really OCD. And so like, I like to have a backup of a backup of a backup. You could go up to your flex real quick, click that button, hit the Insta point and collect a point. You could also do a time point. So in a similar fashion, uh, if you wanted to collect multiple points in the same location, uh, you could. Um, when you take multiple points in the same location and average them, statistically speaking, there's a chance that it will be better than say taking a single shot that has a statistical chance of being an outlier. So what we've done is we've actually added in a couple ways you can uh, log timed points. You can do an average of the points collected. So if you do 30 seconds of points, that's 30 points. You average them and take the average and that's your position. We also uh, give you the ability to do a weighted average. So a little bit of a statistical way to uh, change it up slightly. And then we also give you the ability to over that time period, uh, you have the ability to say, I want to select the best point based on um, the, the GPS accuracy collected and say, out of those 30 points, this is the best one. We're taking point 12. And again, really neat way to kind of um, ensure as a best management practice that you are going to get the best data. Um, we also do raw point logging. Uh, so raw point logging, um, this is going to be closer to um, what we're going to be using for NGS and Opus, right? So we're going to do a raw log that we're then later going to post process. We'll talk about that. We can do track logs. So if you want to lay down a breadcrumb trail everywhere you go, um, which is a really nice insurance policy. So quite frankly, I would recommend whenever I do survey work anyways, I turn on the track log and I just let that run because it is creating a CSV file of all the points of data collection along the way. So why is that important, Nick? It's important because perhaps you're in an app like Esri or microsurvey and it crashes for whatever reason. It's, you know, the app's fault, not necessarily the Flex's fault. Uh, or um, you wanted to cross-reference something collected in an app with something collected right off of the Flex with the authoritative data. You could basically take those two data sets and overlay them in a GIS later and honestly, and double check and QC your work, right? Or if perhaps you had some gaps in the data, that track log you could parse out and select and query certain points at locations and you know, basically extract those vertices into their own individual points. Um, so this is under the logging screen. You see the red box that popped up on the left-hand side of your uh, buttons uh, from your um, smart device. And that's what's gonna pop up the screen on the right. Additionally, if you scroll down on the right, you'll see track logging. There's the last set of options there, it's called project. And so when you start the flex up, it creates a new project. Additionally, you can always create a new project uh, after the flex is turned on, if you'd say wanna compartmentalize uh, different parts of your daily work. Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you ran a boundary survey in the morning and at night you, uh, or in the afternoon, you were doing a drone project. You could create two separate projects, um, know that from the app, so from the device, your, your data collector, uh, kind of using antique, <laughs> um, older terms from survey, um, you can name it. So you could put your own project name, whatever the case may be. Just be aware that if you are doing this natively off of the Flex, the Flex will create a new project, but it's going to do an alphanumeric code for the date and time. So just throwing it out there. So if you want to change the names of these projects, uh, you just need to do that from the app first. Uh, so moving along, you'll see in the lower right hand corner of your screen, uh, there is a logging settings. So these are the ways to log. So you could click any of those blue buttons on the screen and it'll start logging. Um, additionally, we have some further settings. So we can make a prefix on your point names. You can set how long the duration of your time point is. You can set minimum horizontal accuracies. We talked about those algorithms. Uh, averaging, weighted averaging, and uh, best fit or the best uh, best accuracy option. Um, again, prefixing uh, for the track log. You can do the logging rate, capture NMEA. So capture NMEA. I'm going to uh, do a quick poll I created. So we haven't done this in a webinar yet, but I'm going to give it a whirl now. Uh, does anyone out there uh, in the webinar right now do NMEA logging? Does anybody out there do NEMA logging? I'm going to launch the poll right now. 
on your screen, I think you should see a question. It just basically says yes, no, and or what is that? And so we'll give it a couple seconds here. I see results coming in. Hey, Larry. As these results are coming in, I know you, uh, you were uh, curious about this. Perhaps you would uh, tell everybody exactly what NMEA logging is. Sure. So NMEA is the standard output. It's NMEA 183 of a GPS receiver. And some folks will actually use this information with other applications that might be legacy type applications that actually know how to parse and read that type of data. And they use that as kind of a different form of a track log. Thank you, Larry, that's great. Um, so the results say, it's kind of a bell curve here, yes, 36%, no, 23%, and we've got 39% coming in is, what is that? Perfect, so thank you everybody, that uh, helps us up. Um, something we do at Bad Elf quite a bit is we really like to um, listen to our customers, right? And so if we have a huge group of people that are doing more NMEA logging, we want to talk to you, right? And we want to make sure that we are creating a product that's going to work the best for you. So, all right, let me stop sharing those results again. Thank you for that. That's some great feedback. Um, and Terry, I see you asked a question. We will, unless Larry, you want to answer that now. Uh, Terry is asking, what type of uh, NEMA messages do you log? I'll go ahead and answer that one in the background, Nick. Copy that. <laughs> All right. So let's move along, continuing with the settings. Uh, again, prefixes, durations, stops, and then last but not least, you can see the Rhinox header configuration. And so we give the user the ability to adapt how they collect these data, right? So we want to give you the power, you the flexibility to do uh, any type of data collection standalone on the flex uh, that you that you could you know, possibly desire. So let's actually take a look. And I took a quick screenshot here. And where do you get to the logging on the flex itself? So the middle left icon, um, which you can see in the red box there, that's your logging screen. So from the flex itself, um, that screen is going to pull up those same options we saw in the app. And so you've got log instant point, log time point, log raw GCP, so the raw logging. From the flex, the terminology changes just slightly, but um, raw GCP just stands for ground control point. Uh, so it's kind of a workflow so that perhaps if you're not a surveyor or a GIS professional, uh, maybe you're more of a technician or the people that you're handing this to are not so geo savvy. We've made it a really easy process to go collect ground control points, which then could be post-processed uh, with uh, Opus or other sources. Um, you can uh, export logs and delete logs uh, from this screen. I also want to make a quick mention that if you have a Flex or you've seen any of these Flex videos, we always uh, recommend operating the Flex from the GPS RTK information screen. Those are the screens that are going to give you the information like your accuracy, your vertical accuracy, or sorry, horizontal and vertical. It's going to give you PDOP and HDOP and your sky plots. It's going to tell you how good your internet connection is, how much, you know, basically like how many uh, bytes and bits you're downloading uh, to do from your correction source, how far you are from your correction source, you name it. We give a lot of information there, a digital bubble level. If you are watching that screen as a backup or that's the screen you like to operate on, uh, you can simply hit the, the radio button in the middle of the flex, um, this middle circle button, the enter button, and it will bring up this logging screen. And so you don't even have to go off of the GPS and RTK information screen, click the button. And if you wanted to do an instant point, literally it's click, click, and you're off to the races and you're, and you're going to keep moving. All right. So I mentioned um, at the beginning, or, or just a slide ago, that from the logging screen, the last option there says export all logs to USB. And that's an important screen I want to mention to everybody that are going to be doing these standalone data collections that um, 
currently you need to export your logs or your project to your USB. So in the flex, we give you the cable that you see on the screen there. You're going to want to just take a FAT32, that's a fancy way to say a formatted uh, thumb drive or USB drive, plug it into your flex and then export the logs from the flex to said USB drive. That's how we download data from the flex. Uh, it's very simple, but I want to make sure that everybody understands because we've had some feedback that they couldn't find their logs and the truth was that they just needed to export them to the USB. So there is one critical step we want to make sure that everybody hits. So what do the files look like when you pull them off of the Flex? So this is a view from Windows Explorer and you can see here that these are actually several uh, days of data collection. And so you can see here, you know, 2020, the year, 0617, the month and the day, and then the alphanumeric uh, for the project. You can see I downloaded all of them on the 24th here just a few days ago, but there's several projects. Now, each time you download and export, or say export a project out of the Flex and download it, it's gonna create two files for you, right? And those two files are gonna be a JSON file, which you can see here, and a compressed zip file and I want to mention again, it's compressed, so it's a zip folder. We recommend you need to extract everything out of that folder. But these two files come off the Flex. And you can see here that you're, um, when you download it, it's going to create a folder with the serial number from your Flex. So the serial number from my Flex is 144718. So if you have multiple Flexes and data sets, you can easily understand where the data are coming from. Right, so those are the two files, the JSON and the compressed file. And if you open up the JSON file, this is simply what you're gonna see. So some metadata fields that set the system up correctly. And additionally, uh, inside of the zip file, you're gonna see things like this. And so I'm gonna show you two versions of a zip file, one that has raw logging for Opus and one that doesn't. This one, what you're looking at right here, does not. And so what you can see though is what it does contain is a track log, an instant point, a time point, and some metadata files. This is what you'll stereotypically see come out of the flex. Okay, so this CSV file, I wanted to show you that as well. So if you're doing a track log or you're doing a group of instant points, this is how it's gonna create your data. What's great about this is this CSV is easily adaptable, so you can just ingest it right into say your you know, photogrammetry software, your CAD software, your GIS software. Um, but also gives you a lot of the information like H dot B dot P dot type quality, you name it, all these different pieces of information so you can feel very confident about the data that you're collecting with the Flex. I said that uh, there was also raw data. And so inside that zip folder, right? So you export the project and the project's gonna give you two files, a JSON file and a zip file. In that zip file, that's where you're gonna see the track logs and the points, but also these raw files. Right, so raw GCP files for NGS Opus post processing. I wanna make mention here that you can post process data from a standard flex. However, a standard flex is on only L1 single frequency. And so you're gonna to need to use uh, either RTK Lib, which is a software available on our, our website for free, or actually the uh, Canadian um, National Land Service, and I forget the exact name of it, also available on our website, they can process L1 data. If you are gonna use your Extreme Flex and you wanna use OPUS, the, uh, the NOAA provided National Oceanic Atmospheric Organization or At Atmospheric Association, um, sorry, I always get all the um, acronym soup mixed up, but uh, the US-based service, you need to have it in extreme mode, so you're then getting multi-frequency, which is called L1, L2, L5. We can get into some more intricacies there uh, on another topic, but the file that you need to be paying attention to is this .o file. This is what we call an observation file. This observation file is the, the bread and butter, right? So this is the file that you're gonna use from the Flex to upload to Opus to post correct your data to set get get your data um, highly accurate. So, hey Nick, when do I post process data? Post processing data is a great option if one you don't act, have access to cell phone coverage and RTK uh, via NTRIP corrections. You're not using uh, satellite corrections, and you you just want to use the Flex on its own and you want, you're gonna set the flex up for a set amount of time, either rapid static or static, uh, so 15 minutes or, or two hours basically, 
uh, and then you're going to use that to post process, right? So this is a great option if you do not have access to correction sources and you need high accuracy. High accuracy being like you're going to go from 20, 30 centimeters of accuracy down to millimeters of accuracy. So you take this observation file, you go to geodesy.noaa.gov opus. Opus is the online positioning user service. You're going to take that observation file, you're going to click that choose file button, and you're going to upload that file to Opus. Additionally, it's going to ask for an antenna. It says on the screen right now, leave as none coming soon. So we are proud to let you know that we are actively working with the NGS right now to get our antenna inside of the Flex uh, registered on this website. You will see it there soon. We will release that um, one, as, uh, as a news release as soon as it's ready. In the meantime, all you need to do is leave it as none. It's gonna work just fine. Just leave it as none. You don't need it there. Totally cool. What you do need to do though, is you need to put in your instrument height or your IH. And what that's gonna be is 0.23 meters or 23 centimeters plus the rod height. So if you're on a two meter fixed height pole, you need to add 23 centimeters. That's where the phase center is in the flex. So from the base of the flex up into approximately right in this area right here, that's what you need to add to your antenna height for Opus to work correctly so that you are collecting the grade of where your uh, rod is. Put in the address, uh, email address where you want the uh, solution to go, and then you need to upload it to the 15 minute version which is called rapid static or the static version, which is over two hours. Uh, interestingly enough, if you are doing less than four hours of data collection, um, rapid static and static, horizontally speaking, is gonna be virtually the same. Where doing a longer static collection is gonna help you a ton is vertical. So vertical, vertical, vertical. If you want super tight, awesome data. I mean, you wanna post, you, you really do wanna do a rapid, or I'm sorry, a static um, collection of uh, over two hours. Opus is going to send you back this email. In this email, you're going to see there are the results. So you're uploading one point at a time, and it's then sending you back a, um, a corrected point. You can see it gives you the reference frame, gives it to you in ITRF 2014, the lat and the long. It also gives you orthometric height. So if you are looking for orthometric height, this is a way to get there. You can see on the screen, if you use orthometric heights a lot, I just want to let you know that we are super excited that here just very, very soon, orthometric heights and geoid uh, transformations will be native in the flex. I don't want to say anything else and spoil it, but if you are an orthometric person, stay tuned. We're almost there. Um, additionally, Opus will give you UTM coordinates, state plane coordinates, and then you basically can copy and paste out those um, points um, to any software you need. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that standalone data logging is clutch for GCP. So if you're doing ground controls for drones, uh, it, it really, really is the best option. Um, so just to wrap up, because we want to be cognizant of everybody's time, we are doing the Bad Elf Hat Contest. So that was our quick uh, presentation on using the Flex to do standalone data logging. Hopefully you learned something. We'll do a Q&A here in just a second. But... I want to see anybody out there that is interested in a fitted Bad Elf hat. So to be a um, contestant, all you need to do is in the chat right now, say hi, tell us something fun about yourself, how you use GPS, or ask us a question. So we're gonna spend the next 60 seconds. If you would like to try to win a Bad Elf hat, uh, these are really sweet hats, I'm not gonna lie. Um, all you gotta do is in the chat, Go ahead, say hi, and tell us something fun about GPS uh, that you do, or ask us a question. We just want to hear from you, and what we will do is we'll consolidate the name of all the people that uh, say something, and we will do a random selection and uh, announce a winner. So there we go. So thank you, Roland. Thank you, Jason. Simeon, thank you. Rosa, awesome. Daryl, thank you. Raymond, good to hear from you all. Yeah, keep on coming. If you are interested, go ahead and from now until the end of this uh, webinar, all you got to do is say hi. All right. So, Andrew, hi, 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 everybody. Awesome. So, while you guys are typing those in, I want to make sure that we have just a second here to make sure that we answer any Q&A. Larry, were there any questions asked or anything you wanted to wrap up with as people are doing the hat contest? Mm -hmm. 